So this will be the Eyes, Ears, Nose, and Throat Disorders, Chapter 5 of Pants Prep Pearls. So we'll start with ectropion. This is eyelid and lashes are turned outwards, everted, due to relaxation of the orbicularis oculi muscle. Risk factors, most commonly seen in the elderly, tends to be bilateral, but can be congenital, infectious, or part of a cranial nerve 7 palsy. Clinical manifestations, irritation, ocular dryness, tearing, sagging of the eyelid, and increased sensitivity. Management by lubricating eye drops and moisture shields for symptom relief. Surgical correction if needed. Entropion is eyelid and eyelashes are turned inward, inverted, most commonly seen in elderly again. Pathophys may be caused by spasms of the orbicularis oculi muscle. Clinical manifestations, eyelashes may cause corneal abrasion and ulceration. Erythema, tearing, increased sensitivity. Lubricating eye drops and moisture shields for symptomatic relief and surgical correction if needed. Next, dacrocystitis. This is an infection of the lacrimal sac due to obstruction of the nasal lacrimal duct. Etiologies, staph epi, staph aureus, group A beta hemolytic, pseudomonas. And don't get this confused with dacroadenitis. This is dacrocystitis. I'll put pictures of both. Clinical manifestations, acute tearing and signs of infection, tenderness, erythema, edema, and warmth to the medial canthal nasal side of the lower lid area. There may be a purulent drainage. <laughs> Chronic muco mucopurulent drainage from the puncta without any other signs of infection. Management, warm compresses and antibiotics like Clinda, Vanc plus ceftriaxone. Chronic or severe, you could do a dacrocystorhinostomy, which requires topical antibiotics prior to surgery. Next will be blepharitis. This is inflammation of the eyelid margin. Some of the risk factors for blepharitis are Down syndrome, atopic dermatitis, rosacea, seborrheic dermatitis. So it could be posterior with the meibomian gland dysfunction, which is the most common type, or anterior involving the skin base of the eyelashes. And the two types of this anterior is an infectious with staph aureus or staph epidermis or seborrheic. So it could be anterior, seborrheic, or infectious, or posterior due to mimbobian gland dysfunction, which is the most common. Clinical manifestations of blepharitis, burning, erythema, crusting, scaling, and red rimming of the eyelid, pink or erythematous eyelid edges, and flaking on, on the lashes or lid margins. They may also have an entropion or ectropion. For blepharitis, management is eyelid hygiene is the mainstay of treatment, Warm compresses, eyelid scrubbing, and lid washing with baby shampoo, artificial tears. Severe or refractory blepharitis, topical antibiotics, azithromycin solution or ointment, erythromycin or bacitracin, oral antibiotics, topical glucocorticoids, topical cyclosporin. Next, cordiolum, or also known as a sty. This is a localized abscess of the eyelid margin itself. Most common cause is Staphylococcus aureus, over 90%. Increased risk with seborrheic dermatitis and rosacea. The types of hordeolums are external or internal. External is infection of the eyelash follicle or external sebaceous glands near the lid margin with production of pus, um, glands of mole or glands of zeese. Internal is inflammation or infection of a meibomian gland they're found deep from the palpebral margin of the eyelid. So we also said meibomian glands um, are common in posterior blepharitis as well. Clinical manifestations. A focal abscess of a sty is erythematous, painful, warm, nodule, or pustule on the eyelid. Management. Warm compresses are the mainstay of treatment, most eventually um, drained spontaneously. Incision and drainage may be needed if no spontaneous drainage after two days. May add a topical antibiotic ointment like erythromycin or bacitracin if actively draining in some. Next, chalazion. This is a painless, indurated granuloma of the internal mebomian gland, sebaceous, internal mebomian sebaceous gland away from the eyelid margin. 
Pathophys is obstruction of the zeiss or mebomian gland. Remember, mebomian gland is more posterior. Clinical manifestations, non-tender, localized eyelid swelling. It's looking like a nodule on the conjunctival surface of the eyelid. May cause erythema of the affected eyelid. Chalazians are often larger, firmer, and slower growing and less painful or no pain at all than hordeola. Management for chalazion is conservative, eyelid hygiene and warm compresses. Small chalazia will often resolve without intervention in days or weeks. If refractory, you can do ophthalmologist referral for infection or injection of glucocorticoid or incision and curatage may be necessary if no resolution by an ophthalmologist. Next, pinguecula. This is a slow-growing thickening of the bulbar conjunctiva. It's yellow, slightly elevated nodule, most commonly on the nasal side of the sclera, near the limbal conjunctiva. It does not grow onto the cornea. Consists of fat, protein, and calcium. Risk factors often develop uh, pinguecula when the eye is irritated, like dry, windy, or sunny conditions, or ocular trauma. For management, no treatment is needed. They may be resected if chronically inflamed or for cosmetic reasons. Next, pterygium. So it's important to differentiate pterygium from pinguecula. A pterygium is slow-growing thickening of the bulbar conjunctiva, whereas pinguecula doesn't grow. Risk factors associated with ultraviolet exposure in sunny climates like the tropics. Salt, wind, and dust exposure. Almost like an eye self-protective mechanism in the harsh conditions. For clinical manifestations, elevated, superficial, fleshy, triangular shaped, importantly, growing fibrovascular mass that usually starts medially on the nasal side of the eye and extends laterally. May cause irritation, erythema, foreign body sensation. So importantly, triangular shaped growing. Management of pterygium is observation most common. Artificial tears may help. Removal only needed if the growth affects the vision. Globe rupture is next. A globe rupture is the outer membranes of the eye are disrupted by blunt or penetrating trauma. This is an ophthalmologic emergency, immediate ophthalmology consult. Physical exam, visual acuity first always, markedly reduced, may be light perceptive only. It may have diplopia, examination for a relative afferent pupillary defect. Orbits, you may see N ophthalmos or X ophthalmos. Foreign body may be present. Severe conjunctival hemorrhage, 360 degrees bulbar. Corneal and sclera may, may see a misshapen pupil with prolapse of ocular tissue from the sclera or corneal opening. Prolapse of the iris through the cornea and especially a positive Seidel sign. A positive Seidel sign is parting of the fluorescein dye by a clear stream of aqueous humor from the anterior chamber. This is pathognomonic for a globe rupture. Also obscured red reflex, teardrop or irregularly shaped pupil, importantly, and hyphema as well. Management of a globe rupture is a rigid eye shield protects the eye from applied pressure. Impaled objects should be left in place, undisturbed. Also give IV antibiotics and tetanus prophylaxis. Emergent ophthalmology consult. Ophthalmology consult. May need CT scan of the eye without contrast. In cases of suspected globe rupture, avoid topical eye solutions and avoid any procedures that may apply pressure to the eyeball itself, like tonometry or eyelid retraction. Next is an orbital floor or blowout fracture. Fractures to the orbital floor as a result of blunt trauma may lead to trapping of eye structures. The orbital floor consists of the zygomatic, palatine, and maxillary bones. Types of orbital floor blowout fractures are inferior, which is called the floor and blowout flat fracture, and this is the most common type. You'll see orbital fat or inferior rectus muscle may prolapse into the maxillary sinus. There's also possibly the medial, the lamina papyracea. This is the medial orbital blowout fracture. Um, orbital fat and medial rectus muscle may prolapse into the ethmoid air cells, and it's possible to also have a superior roof and lateral wall fracture. Clinical manifestations, the eyes will show, have decreased visual acuity, diplopia, especially with upward gaze, 
as the inferior rectus muscles are entrapped, orbital, orbital emphysema from air from the maxillary sinus, eyelid swelling, especially after blowing the nose. For facial clinical manifestations, you'll see epistaxis, hyperalgesia, or anesthesia to the anterior medial cheek due to stretching of the infraorbital nerve, importantly. Diagnosis, CT scan is the test of choice, localizes the fracture. You'll, you may see a teardrop sign, the inferior herniation of the orbital fat inferiorly into the maxillary sinus. Management of a blowout fracture, nasal decongestions that decrease the pain, and avoid blowing the nose or sneezing, importantly. Also corticosteroids to reduce edema. Antibiotics like ampicillin sylbactam or clindamycin for that broad spectrum and gram positive coverage. Surgical repair. Severe cases, patient with, with N ophthalmos or for persistent diplopia. So for the blowout fractures, don't forget the infraorbital nerve is disrupted. Don't forget the orbital emphysema, the blowout into the maxillary sinus, and the fixed upward gaze. Next, retinoblastoma. Most common primary intraocular malignancy in childhood. Most are, most are diagnosed before three years of age, almost exclusively found in children. There's two types, heritable and non-heritable retinoblastomas. Non-heritable is due to a somatic mutation in the RB1 gene in the tumor. RB1 is a tumor suppressor gene on chromosome 13. So if we lack the RB1 suppressor gene, then it's increased risk of tumor. Also, heritable types of retinoblastoma due to germline mutation in the RB1 gene may develop bilateral retinoblastoma. Importantly, for clinical manifestations, you'll have leukocoria, which is the presence of an abnormal white reflex instead of the normal red reflex. May develop strabismus or nystagmus as well. Diagnosis, a dilated, um, dilated fundoscope examination. Ocular ultrasound, intraocular calcified mass, can also do CT or MRI. For retinoblastoma, you want to manage it with radiation therapy, chemo, and or enucleation. Retinoblastoma can be associated with bone neoplasms as well, like osteosarcoma. It's, faded, it's fatal if untreated, but survival is over 95% if treated promptly. And most common metastasis is to the mandible. Next, macular degeneration. This is the most common cause of permanent legal blindness and vision loss in older adults, especially over 75 years of age. There's two types, wet and dry. Dry is an atrophic type. This is the most common type. Dry is progressive, but it's progressive over decades, so it's much, much slower. Wet is neovascular or exudative, not as common, but more aggressive, and uh, progresses within months. Clinical manifestations of macular degeneration, bilateral, progressive, central vision loss, including detailed and colored vision, central scotomas, also importantly, metaphorpsop, metamorphopsia, which is straight lines appearing bent on the Amsler grid, micropsia, objects seem smaller in the affected eye, also wet macular degeneration may occur more rapidly and is more severe responsible for more cases of blindness due to macular degeneration. On fundoscopic examination of dry atrophic, you may see drusen bodies, which are small, round, yellow-white spots on the outer retina. They represent localized deposits of extracellular material. For wet, neovascular, or exudative, you'll see new abnormal vessels that can cause retinal hemorrhaging and scarring. For diagnosis, it's based on fundoscopy, fluorescein angiography, and Amsler grid. Management of dry, you want to do zinc and antioxidant vitamins, may slow the progression in patients with extensive intermediate sized drusen, but do not reverse the changes. Amsler grid at home to monitor stability. Management of wet, you'll use intravitreal VEGF inhibitors, vessel endothelial growth factor inhibitors. That's bevacizumab, um, which, decrease normal ab which decrease new abnormal vessel formation. That's bevacizumab, a VEGF inhibitor for wet macular degeneration. Also, laser photocoagulation.
So if we use these VEGF inhibitors um, to stop the neovascularization in wet macular degeneration and diabetic retinopathy. And no ampular grid will show metamorphopsia, which is straight lines appear bent in central vision. Next, diabetic retinopathy. The most common cause of new permanent vision loss in 20 to 74 year old patients, usually due to maculopathy. Types, non-proliferative, background, microaneurysms, cotton wool spots, soft exudates that resemble sharp margins often circinate due to lipid or lipoprotein deposits from leaky blood vessels, blot and dot hemorrhages bleeding into the deep retinal layer, flame-shaped hemorrhages, nerve fiber hemor uh, hemorrhage. Also, there's hard exudates. Proliferative, neovascularization, growth of new abnormal blood vessels that can lead to vitreous hemorrhage, also maculopathy, macular edema or exudates, blurred or decreased central vision loss can occur at any stage. Vision loss in non-proliferative often occurs due to macular edema. Management of diabetic retinopathy, non-proliferative, do strict glucose control, maybe laser treatment. For prolifer proliferative, you want to do VEGF inhibitors, again the bevacizumab, laser photocoagulation treatment, strict glucose control. Prevention, annual eye exams are performed in diabetics to detect diabetic retinopathy. Next, hypertensive retinopathy. Damage to the retinal blood vessels from long-standing high blood pressure. Mild, there's mild, moderate, and severe. Mild hypertensive retinopathy is arterial or narrowing due to vasospasm. Shows up as abnormal light reflexes on dilated, tortuous arterioles. Copper wiring describes moderate narrowing. Silver wiring is severe narrowing. AV nicking is venous compression at the arterial venous junction. Okay, uh, moderate hypertensive retinopathy are hemorrhages, flame or dot shaped, cotton wool spots, soft exudates, hard exudates, and microaneurysms. Severe, grade four, all the above plus papilledema, blurring of the optic disc, considered an ophthalmologic emergency. So on normal fundoscope, you'll see the disc to cup ratio. Um, and for hypertensive retinopathy, you'll see an over 50% cup to disc ratio, whereas normal will be under 50%. Next, retinal detachment. Separation of the retina from the underlying retinal pigment epithelium. Risk factors, myopia, previous cataract surgery, advanced age, and trauma. Three types of retinal detachment. Regmatogenous, which is the most common type. This is full thickness retinal tear, causes the retinal inner sensory layer detachment from the choroid plexus. There's also tractional, which are adhesions separate the retina from its base, like, pro like proliferative diabetic retinopathy, also sickle cell disease and trauma, and also an exudative, serous type of retinal detachment, which is fluid that accumulates beneath the retina causing detachment, such as in hypertension, central retinal venous occlusion, and uh, papilledema. Clinical manifestations I remember as F and F, flashing lights and floaters. So there's photopsia, which is flashing lights, with detachment followed by floaters, spots in the visual field, followed by progressive unilateral peripheral vision loss, seen as a shadow or curtain coming down in the periphery, initially followed by central visual field loss. No ocular pain or redness. So unilateral and flashing and floaters. Diagnosis on fundoscopy, you'll see a retinal tear, a detached tissue flapping in the vitreous humor. You see a positive Schaefer's sign, importantly, positive Schaefer's sign for retinal detachment, which is clumping of brown colored pigment, um, pigment vitreous cells in the anterior vitreous humor resembling tobacco dust. Management of retinal detachment, ophthalmologic emergency, keep the patient supine while awaiting consult with the head turned towards the side of the detachment.
to not use meiotic drops. So we want to like keep the gravity pulling the retina connected still to the choroid as opposed to potentially tearing it further off if the patient was prone or something. Um, further management could be laser, cryotherapy, or ocular surgery. <laughs> Next, ophthalmia neonatorum or neonatal conjunctivitis. This is neonatal conjunctival infection um, contracted by newborns during delivery. So it matters what day they're presenting. So day one is most commonly chemical conjunctivitis due to silver nitrate. Artificial tears may be helpful once it occurs. Days two through five, gonococcal will be the most common cause. Presents with purulent conjunctivitis with exudate and swelling of the eyelid. Management of days two to five will be IM or IV ceftriaxone needed once the infection has occurred. Prophylaxis, topical erythromycin used prophylactically to prevent infection only of gonococcal infections. Day five through seven, or Roche says five through 21, um, chlamydia, chlamydial infection is the most common cause. May occur up to 23 days after birth. Management, oral erythromycin once infection has occurred. So they always ask about prevention and prophylaxis of this. So standard neonatal prophylaxis against gonococcal conjunctivitis is given immediately after birth and is erythromycin ointment, 0.5%. Other options include topical tetracycline, silver nitrate, povidone iodide. Neonatal ocular prophylaxis is not effective in preventing neonatal chlamydial conjunctivitis. But the treatment for um, neonatal chlamydial conjunctivitis is oral erythromycin. So erythromycin doesn't prevent it, but it is the treatment for it when they actually get it but it does prevent the gonococcal infections in days two through five. Next, ocular foreign body and corneal abrasion. Clinical manifestations will be a foreign body sensation, tearing, red and painful eye, photopsia, photophobia, blepharospasms, hard to keep the eye open. In diagnosis, by checking the visual acuity first, always, and then fluorescein staining, corneal abrasion, you'll see an ice rink or linear abrasions seen especially if the foreign body is underneath the eyelid, so ever at the eyelid to look for it. Pain often relieved with installation of ophthalmic analgesic drops. Management of foreign body or corneal abrasion. Antibiotic drops for both corneal abrasion and foreign bodies. If they're non-contact lens wearers, erythromycin ointment should be used, or polymyxin trimethoprim, or sulfacetamide. That's for non-contact lens wearers. For contact lens wearers, you have to cover pseudomonas. Use uh, topical ciprofloxacin or ofloxacin. Topical tobramycin or gentamicin are alternatives. For foreign body removal, remove, the sterile, remove with sterile irrigation or moisten sterile cotton swab. Needle via slit lamp if experienced. For corneal abrasions, patching not indicated for small abrasions may patch the eye in some patients with large abrasions, over five millimeters, but do not patch longer than 24 hours. Do not send home with topical anesthetics, may delay healing and cause corneal toxicity. 24 hour ophthalmology follow-up, and a rust ring importantly. Remove the rust ring at 24 hours, usually with rotating burr by an ophthalmologist. Contraindications, do not patch if pseudomonas is suspected such as in contact wares. Antibiotics, covering, antibiotics containing corticosteroids are not used as they can prolong the healing and increase susceptibility to superinfection. Next, bacterial conjunctivitis. Most commonly due to staph aureus in adults, strep pneumoniae, H influenza, um, Morxella cataralis as well. Neisseria gonorrhea and chlamydia are possible too. Transmitted by direct contact in auto-inoculation. So remember, conjunctivitis and writer's arthritis with the conjunctivitis, urethritis, and arthritis. Clinical manifestations, purulent discharge, lid crusting, eyes stuck shut in the morning, conjunctival erythema with no ciliary injection, limbal flush, usually no significant visual changes. Diagnosis, usually clinical, fluorescein staining to look for keratitis or corneal abrasions.
culture and gram stain of the discharge. Management, topical antibiotics, erythromycin ointment, trimethoprim, polymyxin B, fluoroquinolones like moxifloxacin or ofloxacin. Contact lens wearers, again, cover pseudomonas with topical cipro or ofloxacin. Topical aminoglycosides, tobramycin or gentamicin are alternatives for bacterial conjunctivitis. Viral conjunctivitis, inflammation of the conjunctiva, adenovirus is the most common cause. Highly contagious from direct contact, swimming pools are the most common source during outbreaks, and this is most common in children. Clinical manifestations of viral conjunctivitis are a foreign body or gritty sensation, ocular erythema, and especially itching. Normal vision. Often starts unilateral and progresses to bilateral involvement in one to two days. That's important. And also the itching is less itching than allergic conjunctivitis. But importantly for viral, again, is the starting unilateral and progressing to bilateral in one to two days. May have accompanying viral symptoms. Physical exam, you'll have ipsilateral preauricular lymphadenopathy, copious watery tearing, may have a mucoid discharge. The tarsal conjunctiva may have a bumpy appearance with lid eversion, importantly. Also, punctate staining on slit lap examination may be seen. <laughs> Management of viral conjunctivitis. Supportive is the mainstay as it's self-limited. You can do warm to cool compresses, cool compresses, artificial tears, antihistamines for itching and redness like olopatadine, antihistamines with decongestants such as phenyramine nefazoline which is visine. Allergic conjunctivitis, next. Inflammation of the conjunctiva in response to an allergen. Contact of the allergen with the eyes causes mast, causes mast cell degranulation and release of histamine. Clinical manifestations, conjunctival erythema, red eyes with normal vision. May have other allergic symptoms like nasal congestion, sneezing, Marked pruritus, which is hallmark, distinguishes allergic from viral, and this is often bilateral allergic. May have atopic history, such as hay fever, or importantly, Samter's triad, asthma, nasal polyps, and aspirin sensitivity. So remember, Samter's, S-A, always has things with A-S in them. Asthma, nasal polyps, and aspirin sensitive. Physical examination of allergic conjunctivitis, cobblestone mucosa, appearance to the inner upper eyelid, erythema, watery or mucoid discharge, and chemosis, which is conjunctival er uh, edema. No visual defects. Management, symptomatic, is the, uh, symptomatic treatment is the mainstay. You want to use topical antihistamines, H1 blockers, like olopatadine, which is an antihistamine and mast cell stabilizer, also, veniramine nefazoline, again, which is visine, which is an antihistamine and decongestant. Topical NSAIDs, Ketorolac. Next, ocular chemical burns. These are ophthalmic emergencies. So, alkali burns are worse than acids. They cause liquefactive necrosis, which denatures proteins and collagen, causes thrombosis of vessels. Acidic burns are coagulative necrosis. H plus precipitates uh, protein barrier, dis uh, destroy, destroys it. Cleaners and batteries. So think alkali, A-L, is liquefactive with an L. And um, acidic is coagulative necrosis. Clinical presentation, ocular pain, decreased vision, blepharospasms, inability to open the eyelids, and photophobia. Management of these burns, immediate irrigation until a neutral pH of 7.0 to 7.4 is achieved with lactated ringers or normal saline. LR is ideal because it is closer to a normal pH and is less irritating. Unless there is a strong suspicion for globe rupture, do not delay irrigation. Often irrigated for at least 30 minutes. Once the pH is normal, the eye can be safely examined. Topical antibiotic polymyxin trimethoprim, erythromycin ointment, or moxifloxacin. Strabismus is next. This is a misalignment of one or both eyes. Stable ocular alignment is not usually present until two, two to three months of age. 
referral needed for immediate or intermediate manifest strabismus. Referral needed for intermediate manifestations of strabismus needed if it persists over four to six months of age to reduce incidence of amblyopia. Major types are esotropia, which is a convergent strabismus, which is deviated inwards, nasally, cross-eyed. Exotropia, which is divergent strabismus, which is deviated outwards, temporally. Clinical manifestations are diplopia, scotomas, or amblyopia. Physical examination, asymmetric corneal reflex, which helps rule out uh, pseudostrabismus with, with the epicanthal folds covering it. Diagnosis, you need to do the Hirschberg corneal light reflex testing. It's often used as an initial screening. As you'll see, asymmetry deflecting the corneal light reflex in one eye as seen in strabismus. The cover test, refixation of the uncovered eye consistent with manifest strabismus, tropia, or the cover-uncover test, looks for latent strabismus, aphoria. The, um, the misaligned will appear to deviate inward or outward, convergence testing. So aphoria is latent, can only reveal it with cover-uncover test in the covered eye. Management of refractive error, a patch or occlusive therapy is first-line management for this type of strabismus. Normal eye is covered to stimulate and strengthen the affected eye. So basically cover the good eye and make the trophic eye do the work. Eyeglasses, also corrective surgery if severe and unresponsive to this conservative treatment. So a tropia is visible even with no test. And aphoria needs the cover-uncover test because it's latent. Next, orbital and septal cellulitis. Infection of the orbit, the fat and ocular muscles, posterior to the orbital septum, often polymicrobial, staph aureus, streptococci, group A, and haemophilus influenza. Most commonly in children age 17 to 12, age 7 to 12 years old. In etiologies, most common secondary to sinus infection, such as in the ethmoid, most commonly. Less common is an untreated blepharitis, facial trauma, ophthalmic surgery, facial or dental infections. But remember, most common secondary to ethmoid infections. Clinical manifestations of orbital septal cellulitis, ocular pain, especially with eye movements, ophthalmoplegia, which is extraocular muscle weakness, with diplopia and proto um, proptosis, which is bulging and visual changes, eyelid edema and erythema. How I remember it is orbital cellulitis, POP, P-O-P, proptosis, ophthalmoplegia, and pain on movement, whereas preceptal does not have pain on movement. So POP for that. Diagnosis, clinical diagnosis, can be confirmed by CT scan, and high-resolution CT scan will show infection of the fat and ocular muscles behind the septum. MRI can also be done. Management, admission, and IV antibiotics. VANC plus one of the following, ceftriaxone or cefotaxime. You can also use ampicillin, sulbactam, pip, tazo, and clindamycin. So you want to get gram-positive and negative coverage for this. Next, preceptal periorbital cellulitis. So less severe. Infection of the eyelid and periocular tissue anterior to the orbital septum, most commonly due to sinusitis or contiguous infection of the soft tissue of the eyelids and face, such as insects or animal bites. Most common causes include staph aureus, including MRSA, strep, strep, and uh, anaerobes. Clinical manifestations of preceptal cellulitis, usually unilateral ocular pain, eyelid erythema and edema. Importantly, the absence of proptosis ophthalmoplegia, and ocular pain with extraocular movements clinically distinguishes preceptal from postseptal. So preceptal has no POP, proptosis, ophthalmoplegia, pain on movement. <clears throat> Diagnosis, often clinical. CT scan, best test to distinguish between preceptal and postseptal cellulitis if the diagnosis is uncertain. Management, outpatient management if over one year of age and mild. MRSA coverage, oral clinda, monotherapy, no vancomycin. Other options include Bactrim, 
plus uh, amoxicillin or amoxicillin clavulonic or cefpodoxime. Next, keratitis, corneal ulcer and inflammation, not a corneal abrasion. So first, bacterial keratitis. This is a corneal ulceration or inflammation. It may rapidly progress and be site-threatening. Includes staph aureus, strep, pseudomonas if they're contact lens wearers. Risk factors are improper contact lens wear is the greatest risk factor. Dry ocular surfaces, inability to fully close the eyes in patients with Bell's palsy. Remember, a cranial nerve 7 deficit. Topical corticosteroid use and immunosuppression. Clinical manifestations, ocular pain, photophobia, eye redness, vision changes, ocular discharge, tearing, foreign body sensation, difficulty in keeping the affected eye open, physical exam, conjunctival erythema, ciliary injection, also called a limbal flush, importantly, a hazy cornea, which is corneal opacification and ulceration, and a hypopion in severe cases. Slit lamp test will see increased fluorescein uptake, deeper than an abrasion. Both increase uptake, but a ulceration is much deeper than an abrasion. Management, fluoroquinolones topically, moxifloxacin, after obtaining corneal cultures if possible, same day ophthalm <laughs> ophthalmology follow-up. Do not patch the eye. Use of topical corticosteroids are controversial at the discretion by the ophthalmologist. Herpes keratitis, this is corneal infection and inflammation usually due to reactivation of herpes simplex virus in the trigeminal ganglion, so very important. Remember the parts of the trigeminal nerve, the ophthalmic nerve, maxillary, major part of blindness and mandibular, major cause of blindness in the US. Clinical manifestations, acute onset of unilateral ocular pain, photophobia, eye redness, watery discharge, blurred vision. Physical examination for herpes keratitis. Importantly, again, limbal injection, the ciliary flush, flush hazy cornea, and preauricular lymphadenopathy, especially seen in viral conjunctivitis too, that preauricular lymphadenopathy. And for diagnosis, the most important thing for herpes keratitis is the dendritic branching corneal ulceration with fluorescein staining. This is hallmark for herpes keratitis. Management is topical antivirals like trifluoridine and gangcyclovir, also PO acyclovir, corneal transplantation in severe refractory cases. Next will be uveitis, also known as iritis. Anterior iritis is inflammation of the iris, iritis, or ciliary body, cyclitis. So remember, cyclitis from juvenile arthritis and iritis also from IBD, especially ulcerative colitis. Posterior, choroid inflammation. Etiologies, systemic inflammatory and autoimmune diseases like HLA B27, HLA -B27 spondyloarthropathies, also sarcoidosis and IBD. Infectious, CMV, cytomegalovirus, toxoplasmosis, syphilis, and tuberculosis, also trauma. Clinical manifestations, anterior, unilateral severe ocular pain and photophobia, eye redness, tearing, blurred or decreased vision. For posterior uveitis, blurred or decreased vision, floaters, and may not be painful. On physical examination, conjunctival erythema, ciliary injection, again a limbal flush, consensual photophobia, constricted pupil, meiosis as well. Constricted pupil is meiosis. Um, diagnosis, slit lamp, inflammatory, and cells in flare, importantly, cell, which is cells equaling the white blood cells in flare, proteins in the vitreous humor. So cells in flare for uveitis or iritis. And uh, management for anterior, you want to do topical glucocorticoids, relief of spasm with scopolamine or to, um, topical cycloplegics like cyclopentolate or homotropine. If you have posterior uveitis, again, system, well, actually systemic glucocorticoids. So anterior topical glucocorticoids, posterior systemic glucocorticoids.
Infectious, also want to treat as appropriate, viral, bacterial, etc. Cataracts. Lens opacification, thickening of the lens, usually bilateral. Most common cause of blindness in the world. Risk factors, aging, cigarette smoking, glucocorticoid use, diabetes, UV light, malnutrition and trauma. Also neonatal cataracts, congenital torch syndrome, toxoplasmosis, rubella, CMV, and HSV. So I remember the risk factors, CAST, C-A-S-D, cigarettes, age, steroids, and diabetes. Clinical manifestations, painless, slow, progressive blurred or vision loss over months to years, difficult with night driving and also reading signs. F uh, physical examination, absent red reflex and an opaque lens. Management, observation if mild. Um, cataract surgery indicated if visual changes affect activities of daily living. Next, papilledema. This is optic nerve disc swelling secondary to increased intracranial pressure, usually bilaterally. Etiologies, idiopathic intracranial hypertension, space occupying lesion like a cerebral tumor or abscess, also increased CSF production, cerebral edema, or severe hypertension. Clinical manifestations of papilledema, headache, nausea, vomiting, vision is often preserved, however. Diagnosis, fundoscopy. Swollen optic disc with blurred margins. MRI or CT of the head first to rule out a mass effect, followed by an LP, increased CSF pressure. Management, acetazolamide, which decreases production of aqueous humor and CSF production. Also treat the underlying cause. So now we'll go over the difference between papilledema, papillitis, retrobulbar neuritis, and glaucoma. So papilledema is edema of the, optic head, of the optic nerve head due to increased CSF pressure. It's typically bilateral and an enlarged blind spot will be had and blurred disc to cup ratio with a negative Marcus gun pupil and our goal is to re reduce the intracranial pressure. For papillitis, this is edema of the optic nerve in the, op in the orbit or eye, optic neuritis. It's usually unilateral, and it ranges from a central scotoma to complete loss of vision. It'll have blurred disc to cup ratio, but it'll be a Marcus Gunn positive pupil, and management is corticosteroids of papillitis. Retrobulbar neuronitis, edema of the optic nerve behind the eye, optic neuritis, usually unilateral, ranges from central scotoma to complete vision loss, normal, Fundoscopy, fundoscopy, positive Marcus gun pupil, and management is corticosteroids. And glaucoma, edema of the optic nerve from increase in intraocular pressure. Acute is unilateral, chronic bilateral, halos around the eyes to blindness, and also a blurred disc to cup ratio. Negative Marcus gun pupil, and our goal is to reduce the intraocular pressure. Next, optic neuritis, or optic nerve cranial 2 inflammation. Acute inflammatory demyelination of the optic nerve. Risk factors, most common in women and in young patients 20 to 40, the age of patients with multiple sclerosis. Etiologies, multiple sclerosis, autoimmune, medications, ethambutol, chloramphenicol, PDE5 inhibitors, also hydroxychloroquine, importantly. Clinical manifestations, painful loss of vision, decrease in color vision, desaturation, Visual field defects, central scotoma, which is a blind spot, over hours to a few days, usually unilateral. So painful vision loss, central scotoma, desaturation, and unilateral. Physical examination, ocular pain worse with eye movement. Marcus gun pupil, relative afferent pupillary defect, is a Marcus gun pupil. During the swinging flashlight test, from the unaffected eye into the affected eye, the pupil, the pupils appear to dilate. Fundoscopy, two-thirds normal disc to cup ratio, or one-third optic disc swelling and, blur and blurring, which is papillitis. MRI confirms the diagnosis when multiple sclerosis is suspected. Management, IV methylprednisolone is the initial management followed by oral glucocorticoids. Vision usually returns with treatment.
Next, we'll go over Marcus Gunn pupil, the relative afferent pupillary defect. The Marcus Gunn pupil, the relative afferent pupillary defect. The most common cause is an optic neuritis, but also severe retinal disease can cause it, such as a central retinal venous occlusion or central retinal artery occlusion and significant retinal detachment. So the Marcus Gunn pupil is during a swinging flashlight test into the unaffected eye, both pupils constrict. So the Marcus Gunn, during swinging flashlight test from the unaffected eye into the affected eye, the pupils appear to dilate due to less than normal constriction. <clears throat> so relative afferent pupillary defect, when you shine a ray in the affected pupil, it dilates and you would expect it to constrict. So cranial nerve 2 doesn't work as good, so it doesn't constrict appropriately. Argyll Robinson pupil. This is near light dissociation. Pupil constricts on accommodation, but does not react to bright light. Some of the causes of an Argyll Robinson pupil are neurosyphilis, most commonly, also midbrain lesions, and diabetic neuropathy. So an Argyll Robinson pupil can be remembered by ARP, Argyll Robinson pupil, and accommodation reflex is present, but pupillary reflex is absent if you put it from backwards to front, PRA. Pupillary reflex absent, but the accommodation reflex is present. Next, visual pathway defects. For visual pathway defects, it depends on where in the optic nerve the optic chiasm or the optic tract that is affected it will lead to. This can best be displayed by an image. So you can see that total blindness of one eye if the lesion is on the optic nerve or the retina itself. You can have ipsilateral nasal hemianopsia if the lesion is lateral to the optic chiasm. You can have bitemporal heteron heteronymous hemianopsia if the midline optic chiasm lesion, such as a pituitary adenoma that grows bigger and occludes the chiasm. You can have contralateral homonymous hemianopsia <clears throat> if the lesion is an optic tract or in the occipital lobe stroke. Narrow angle closure glaucoma, increased intraocular pressure leading to damage of the optic nerve. This is an ophthalmologic emergency, leading cause of preventable blindness in the U.S. Risk factors for narrow angle closure glaucoma are patients with pre-existing narrow angle or large lens, age over 60, hyperopes, aka farsighted, females and Asians. Pathophysiology, decreased drainage of aqueous humor via the trabecular meshwork and canal of Schlem. Precipitants? Mydriasis, which is pupillary dilation, further closes the angle. So dim lights, sympathomimetics, as well as anticholinergics, which block this parasympathetic. Clinical manifestations. Sudden onset of severe unilateral ocular pain. Vision changes include halos around lights, loss of peripheral vision, tunnel vision, also nausea, vomiting, and headache. I mean, this can, loss of peripheral vision can also happen monocularly in a retinal detachment where you see the f um, floaters and flashes. But for acute narrow angle closure glaucoma, the physical examination, um, you'll see conjunctival erythema, a cloudy or steamy cornea, and a mid-dilated fixed pupil. Diagnosis, tonometry, increased intraocular pr pressure over 21, so about 10 to 20 is normal. Fundoscopy, you see optic disc blurring or cupping of the optic nerve, thinning of the outer rim of the optic nerve head. Management, combination of topical agents, timolol, apricolinidine, pilocarpine, with a systemic agent to lower intraocular pressure. And the systemic agent might be PO or IV acetazolamide or IV mannitol. Topical beta blockers like timolol does not affect visual acuity. Alpha-2 agonists, apriclonidine and bromonidine, myotics or cholinergics, pilocarpine or carbacol 
also prostaglandins like latanoprost. Definitive management is an iridotomy, which can be done laser <coughs> or surgical. Um, so the best is typically, in Roche, says the best is prostaglandins. And also, it's important to know that the mid-dilated fixed pupil is due to the pupil being unable to open and close as good due to the increased pressure behind it. So next will be chronic open angle glaucoma. Slow, progressive, painless bilateral peripheral vision loss compared to the rapid, painful unilateral vision in acute glaucoma. Risk factors, African Americans, over 40 years old, family history, also diabetics. Pathophysiology, open angle, normal anterior chamber. The increased intraocular pressure in chronic open angle glaucoma is due to the reduced aqueous humor drainage through the trabeculum, which eventually drains, which eventually damages the optic nerve. Clinical manifestations of chronic open angle are usually asymptomatic until later in the disease course, and vision loss is usually the presenting symptom. Slow, progressive, painless, bilateral, peripheral vision loss, tunnel vision, progressing to central loss. On physical exam, you'll see cupping of the optic discs, increased cup to disc ratio, and notching of the disc rim. Management, reduce intraocular pressure. Prostaglandin analogs are the first line in chronic. Latanoprost, greater reduction in intraocular pressure. Beta blockers like timolol, alpha-2 adrenergic agonists like bromonidine, aproclonidine, acetazolamide, which is a carbonic anhydrase inhibitor. You can also do laser therapy, a trabeculoplasty, if medical therapy fails. Increase, increases in aqueous humor outflow by improving drainage of the aqueous humor is via the trabecular meshwork. Surgery is the last line, however, for chronic open angle glaucoma. Next, amaurosis fugo is a transient monocular vision loss, lasting minutes, with complete recovery, maybe binocular as well. Etiologies, disorders affecting the eye or the optic nerve, retinal emboli, or ischemia, like a TIA, can be seen with transient ischemic attack, TIA, carotid artery disease, giant cell arteritis, central retinal artery occlusion, migraine, and a visual aura, SLE, and other vasculitis disorders. Clinical manifestations, vision loss descending over the visual field, described as a temporary curtain or shade coming down and resolving, lifting up, usually within one hour. TIAs typically last one to five minutes. Migraine aura usually lasts about 10 to 30 minutes. Diagnosis is determined by the likely cause based on the history and physical examination. Others include carotid duplex and ophthalmologic examination, MRI and EEG as well. Next, the central retinal artery occlusion, CRAO. So remember for this, the box car and uh, most common is the retinal artery thrombus or embolus, ophthalmologic emergency. Most common in 50 to 80 years old, history of atherosclerotic disease. Etiologies, emboli from carotid artery atherosclerosis, most common. Car cardiogenic emboli, second most common cause overall, but most common cause in younger patients and patients without atherosclerosis. Also vasculitis. Clinical manifestations of CRAO, acute, sudden, painless, monocular vision loss, may be preceded by amaurosis fugo, may have an ipsilateral carotid brewery. Diagnosis? Fundoscopy, retinal ischemia. You'll see a, importantly, pale retina with a cherry red macula. Blood flow blocked to the retina. You'll also see a boxcar appearance of the retinal vessels. Segmentation of blood flow. Also, emboli may be seen in 20%. Management, no consensus on optimal treatment. The initial treatment may include CO2 rebreathing, 100% oxygen, ocular massage, importantly, to dilate the vessels and attempt to dislodge the clot, decompression of the anterior chamber, such as with acetazolamide or chamber paracentesis, 
ophthalmology consult and in situ fibrinolysis. You're just injecting that fibrinolytic agent into that artery itself. Prognosis, it's a very poor prognosis even with treatment. No treatment has been shown to truly be effective, but should be attempted anyways. CRVO, central retinal vein occlusion. Remember, this is the blood and thunder appearance. Thrombus in the central retinal vein that leads to fluid backup in the retina. Risk factors for CRVO are hypertension, diabetes, glaucoma, hypercoagulable states like polycythemia, vera, multiple myeloma, and smoking. Sudden onset of painless monocular vision loss. Diagnosis is on fundoscopy. Extensive retinal hemorrhages, the classic blood and thunder appearance. Retinal vein dilation, macular edema, optic disc swelling may be seen. May have relative afferent pupillary defect, which is again the Marcus Gunn pupil. Management, no definitive treatment. Next, moving to ear disorders. Otitis externa. Otitis externa is inflammation of the external auditory canal. Risk factors are water immersion. Since it's called swimmer's ear, excess moisture raises the pH from the normal acidic pH of the ear, facil facilitating bacterial overgrowth. So the natural uh, acidic pH of the external ear helps to keep bacterial growth at bay. So uh, increasing the pH will make it increase growth. Local mechanical trauma such as the use of Q-tips, ages 7 to 12 years old, and also aberrant earwax, too much or too little, as it actually has a protective function. Etiologies, pseudomotus aeruginosa in most cases, 50%. Also staph, aureus and epidermidis. Group A, beta hemolytic staph, strep, proteus, anaerobes, aspergillus, and fungi. Clinical manifestations of botanus externa, ear pain, pruritus in the ear canal, may have recent activity of swimming, auricular discharge, ear pressure or fullness, or hearing loss. On physical exam, pain on traction of the ear canal or tragus, purulent auricular discharge. Diagnosis, clinical plus otoscopy, edema of the external auditory canal with erythema, debris, or discharge. Management of otitis externa, protect the ear against moisture, Drying, ed drying agents include isopropyl alcohol and acetic acid, plus removal of the debris and cerumen, plus topical antibiotics with coverage against pseudomonas and staph, with or without glucocorticoids for inflammation. So the topical antibiotics, Ciprodex, ciprofloxacin and dexamethasone, you can also use ofloxacin. So remember, Ciprodex for otitis externa. You can also use an aminoglycoside combination, neomycin, polymyxin, hydrocortisone, but keep in mind the contraindication with aminoglycosides are not to be used if tympanic perforation is suspected or if TM cannot be visualized as aminoglycosides are ototoxic. Next, malignant necrotizing otitis externa. This is an invasive infection of the external auditory canal and skull base, the temporal bone, soft tissue, and cartilage. It's a complication of acute otitis externa. Pseudomonas is over 95% of the causes of malignant otitis externa. <clears throat> Risk factors are especially immunocompromised states like elderly diabetics most commonly, high-dose glucocorticoid therapy, chemo, and advanced HIV. Clinical manifestations of malignant necrotizing otitis externa are severe auricular pain, otorrhea, also cranial nerve palsies, especially cranial nerve 7, if osteomyelitis occurs. May radiate to the temporal mandibular joint, TMJ, pain with chewing. In physical exam, severe auricular pain on traction of the ear canal or tragus. For diagnosis, otoscopy, edema of the external auditory canal with erythema, discharge, granulation tissue at the bony cartilaginous junction of the ear canal floor and also frank necrosis of the ear canal skin. CT or MRI to confirm the diagnosis. Biopsy is of course the most accurate test. Management, admission in IV anti-pseudomonal antibiotics, like IV Cipro is first line. Alternatives are PIP, Tazo, Ceftazidime, and Cefepime. Next, mastoiditis. 
Mastoiditis is an infection of the mastoid air cells of the temporal bone, largely a disease of childhood, especially under two years old. Etiologies, usually a complication of acute otitis media. Clinical manifestations, deep ear pain, usually worse at night, fever, lethargy, and malaise. Physical exam on mastoiditis, otalgia, fever, signs of otitis media, bulging and erythematous TM, mastoid, post-auricular, tenderness, edema, and erythema. Protrusion of the auricle may develop cutaneous abscess and fluctuants, or a narrowed auditory canal. So from behind it, it's getting bigger. Diagnosis, CT scan with contrast is the first line diagnostic test. Management, cover pseudomonas, IV antibiotics plus middle ear or mastoid drainage, a myringotomy, with or without tympanostomy tube placement. IV vancomycin plus ceftazidime or cefepime or piptazo. Tympanocentesis can be, formed, can be performed to get cultures. Refractory or complicated? Mastoidectomy. Chronic otitis media. This is recurrent or persistent infection of the middle ear and or mastoid cell system in the presence of TM perforation over six weeks. So importantly for chronic otitis media, you need two things, perforation and over six weeks. Etiology, pseudomonas again is the most common, staph aureus, gram negative rods like proteus, anaerobes, mycoplasma can become worse after a URI or after water enters the ear. Clinical manifestations of chronic, you have a perforated tympanic membrane plus persistent or recurrent purulent otorrhea, often painless. Ear fullness, varying degrees of conductive hearing loss. May have a primary or secondary cholesteatoma. Management of chronic otitis media, removal of infected debris plus topical antibiotic drops or first line, ofloxacin or ciprofloxacin. Systemic antibiotics reserved for severe cases. In patients with tympanic membrane rupture, avoid water, moisture, and topical aminoglycosides in the ear whenever there is a TM rupture. Surgical, tympanic membrane repair or reconstruction. So exam tip, acute otitis media is effusion plus signs or symptoms of inflammation like fever, ear pain with bulging, and marked ear thema of the TM as opposed to chronic otitis media is a perforated tympanic membrane plus persistent or recurrent purulent otorrhea over six weeks, otalgia, ear fullness, varying degrees of conductive hearing loss. Also serous otitis media, otitis media with effusion. Asymptomatic effusion plus no signs of inflammation, not an infection, no fever, no ear pain, no marked ear thema or bulging of the TM in serous otitis media or otitis media with effusion. So acute otitis media, infection of the middle ear, temporal bone, and mastoid air cells. Acute otitis media is a rapid onset plus signs and symptoms of inflammation. Risk factors, peak age of 6 to 18 months. Eustachian tube in children is shorter, narrower, and more horizontal. Daycare, pacifiers, bottle use, secondhand smoke, not being breastfed are also risk factors. So the pathogens can easily travel from the mouth to the ear through the eustachian tube, especially in children. Four most common organisms are strep pneumoniae is the most common, then H flu, Marxella cateralis, and group A strep. So same organisms as seen in acute sinusitis. Pathophysiology most commonly preceded by viral URI, leading to blockage of the eustachian tube. Clinical manifestations. Fever, otalgia, ear pain, ear tugging in infants, importantly, stuffiness, conductive hearing loss. Tympanic membrane rupture leads to a rapid relief of symptoms, plus otorrhea, and it usually heals in just one to two days. So that's important. TM rupture is a rapid relief of pain, plus otorrhea, and usually heals in one to two days. You also see ear tugging in infants in AOM. Physical exam, bulging and erythematous TM with effusion, loss of landmarks. Pneumatic otoscopy, decreased TM mobility, which is the most sensitive. Diagnosis of acute otitis media, 
clinically, also tympanosynthesis for a sample of fluid for culture is definitive. And this is done usually in refractory cases or recurrent cases too. Management observation can be done depending on the age and severity. Children over the age of two should receive antibiotics if the diagnosis is certain and the infection is severe. Amoxicillin is the initial antibiotic of choice. And second line is augmentin. You can also do ceftonir, cefpodoxime, cefiroxime. Penicillin allergy, azithromycin, clarithromycin, erythromycin, and trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole, Bactrim. Severe or recurrent cases, myringotomy, which is surgical drainage with tympanostomy tube insertion. In children with recurrent otitis media, may need an iron deficiency anemia workup and CT scan. So main treatment is amoxicillin first line, second line augmentin. And over two years old and severity of symptoms, definitely to prescribe antibiotics. Serous otitis media with effusion. This is a middle ear fluid plus no signs or symptoms of acute inflammation. No fever, no ear pain, no marked erythema or bulging of the TM may be seen after resolution of acute otitis media or in patients with eustachian tube dysfunction, importantly. Diagnosis of otitis media with effusion. Otoscopy. Effusion with tympanic membrane that is retracted or flat. Hypomobility with insufflation. Management. Observation in most cases. Usually spontaneously resolves. Persistent or complicated. Tympanostomy tube for drainage children with hearing impairment, developmental delays, or specific conditions. Next will be eustachian tube dysfunction. The eustachian tube swelling inhibits the eustachian tube ability to auto-insufflate, causing negative pressure. This often follows a viral URI or allergic rhinitis, or sinusitis or tumors. Clinical manifestations is an obstructive dysfunction where ear fullness or pressure, popping of the ears, underwater feeling, Disequilibrium, fluctuating conductive hearing loss, and tinnitus can occur. Diagnosis of ET dysfunction is clinical. Ot um, otoscopy findings usually normal. May have fluid behind the TM, a serous otitis media, with bubbling from the negative pressure pulling through the ET tube. Management, treatment of the underlying cause and symptom management is the mainstay. Auto insulfation. Swallowing, yawning, blowing against a slightly pinched nostril. Also, intranasal corticosteroids if sinonasal inflammation is present. Decongestions for symptom relief. And congestion relief. Pseudoephedrine, phenylephrine, oxymetazoline, nasal. Next, barotrauma. Barotrauma is damage to the tympanic membrane that can occur with sudden pressure changes like flying, diving, decompression, hyperbaric oxygen. Manifestations are ear fullness, pain, and hearing loss that persists after the etiologic event. Physical examination may have bloody auricular discharge if traumatic. Also, visualization of the tympanic membrane may reveal rupture or petechiae. Management is avoidance as the best treatment, and you want to avoid flying with a cold. Also, you can try auto insufflation, which is swallowing, yawning, and chewing gum. Auditory exam findings are next. We'll look at air conduction versus bone conduction for two different tests. So first, normal. If you have a normal hearing, the Weber test, which is the which is the no lateralization, Rene, will be placed on the mastoid of the ear and normal will be a positive with air conduction over bone conduction. Sensory neural loss of the inner ear, the Weber will lateralize to the normal ear. And for Rene, with sensory neural loss, you'll find normal air conduction greater than bone conduction. Difficulty hearing their own voice and deciphering words will be heard. Conductive loss, which is the external or middle ear. For the Weber, you'll have lateralization to the affected ear and for Rene, bone conduction over greater than air conduction, which is negative. Sensory neural loss lateralizes to the normal ear and is a positive Rene. 
So conductive hearing loss. This is external or middle ear disorders. A defect in sound conduction, like an obstruction from a foreign body or cerumen impaction. Also damage to the ossicles from otosclerosis, cholesteatoma, mastoiditis, or otitis media. However, cerumen impaction is the most common cause of conductive hearing loss. Sensory neural hearing loss, on the other hand, is an inner ear disorder, like presbycusis, chronic loud noise exposure, CNS lesions like acoustic neuroma, labyrinthitis, or Meniere's syndrome. Presbycusis is the most common cause of sensory neural hearing loss. Next, cerumen impaction. This is external auditory canal wax impaction. It may lead to conductive hearing loss and ear fullness. Um, for conductive hearing loss pattern, you'll have the lateralization to the affected ear on the Weber test, and you'll have bone conduction greater than air conduction. Management, cerumen softening which, with hydrogen peroxide or carbamide peroxide. Oral toilet, irrigation, curate, curate removal of cerumen, and suction. Irrigation, if no evidence of TM perforation in water, must be at body temperature to prevent vertigo. Tympanic membrane perforation itself, rupture of the tympanic membrane, may lead to cholesteatoma development. Etiologies most commonly occurs due to penetrating or noise trauma. Most commonly occurs at the pars tensa or otitis media. Clinical manifestations, acute ear pain and hearing loss. Patients with otalgia prior to the rupture may develop a sudden pain relief with bloody otorrhea, tinnitus, and vertigo as well. Otoscopic examination, perforated TM, do not perform pneumatic otoscopy. May have conductive hearing loss. Weber, lateralization to the affected ear. And for Rene, bone conduction greater than air conduction. Management, most perforated TMs heal spontaneously but follow up to ensure resolution. You can use topical antibiotics, ofloxacin and some, and avoid water and topical aminoglycosides in the, in the ear whenever the TM is ruptured, importantly. Next, cholesteatoma. This is an abnormal keratinized collection of desquamated squamous epithelium in the middle ear that can lead to bony erosion of the mastoid. Etiologies? most commonly due to chronic middle ear disease or eustachian tube dysfunction. Cholesteatoma clinical manifestations are painless odoria, brown or yellow discharge with a strong odor. Also, they may develop uh, peripheral vertigo, tinnitus, dizziness, or cranial nerve palsies. Diagnosis, on otoscopy, there's granulation tissue, which is cellular debris, may have perforation with tympanic membrane. Conductive hearing loss. Lateralization to the affected ear on Weber testing and bone conduction greater than air conduction in the affected ear on the Rene test. Management, surgical excision of the debris and cholesteatoma with reconstruction of the ossicles. So cholesteatoma must be removed. Otosclerosis. Otosclerosis is abnormal bony overgrowth in the foot plate of the stapes leading to conductive hearing loss. This is an autosomal dominant disorder. They may have a family history of conductive hearing loss. So very important to note that these patients will have a family history and it's a genetic disorder. Clinical manifestations, slowly progressive conductive hearing loss, especially low frequencies, also tinnitus, and vertigo is uncommon with otosclerosis. Diagnosis, conductive hearing loss, lateralization, to the affected ear on Weber testing and bone conduction greater than air conduction in the affected ear on Rene testing. Tone audiometry is most useful. For management, stapedectomy with prosthesis or hearing amplification, like a hearing aid. Cochlear implantation, if severe. Next, we'll move into vertigo, which is a false sense of motion or exaggerated sense of motion. And there's two main types, peripheral and central. So for central vertigo, this is brainstem or cerebell cerebellar involvement. Some of the, um, some of the ca causes are cerebropontine tumors, migraine, CVAs, multiple sclerosis, 
vestibular neuroma. And clinically, for central vertigo, you have vertical nystagmus that's non-fatigable or continuous. Gait issues are more severe. It's gradual in onset and has positive CNS signs. So VNC is how I remember it. Vertical, nystagmus, non-fatigable, and is a central cause. On the other hand, peripheral vertigo. The location is the labyrinth or vestibular nerve, so part of the cranial nerve 8. Etiologies, benign positional vertigo, which is most common. This has episodic vertigo with no hearing loss. Another etiology is Meniere's disease, which has also episodic vertigo plus hearing loss. Another etiology will be vestibular neuritis, which is continuous vertigo and no hearing loss, and labyrinthitis, which is the worst, continuous vertigo and hearing loss. Cholesteatoma could also cause this. Clinical is horizontal nystagmus, usually beats away from the affected eye, and it's fatigable. So a sudden onset of tinnitus and hearing loss usually associated with peripheral as compared to central causes. So how I remember this is HFA, horizontal, fatigable, acute. Next we'll go into the management of nausea and vomiting in patients with vertigo. Nausea and vomiting is caused by a sensory conflict mediated, mediated by neurotransmitters, GABA, acetylcholine, histamine, dopamine, and serotonin. Therefore, antiemetics work primarily by blocking these neurotransmitters. Antihistamines and anticholinergics such as meclizine, scopolamine, which is an anticholinergic, dimenhydrinate, and diphenhydramine. The mechanism of action of these are to act on the brain's control center for nausea, vomiting, and dizziness, indicated first line for vertigo with nausea and vomiting, as well as motion sickness. Side effects are anticholinergic, like dry mouth, blurred vision, dilated pupils, urinary retention, constipation, dry skin, flushing, tachycardia, fever, delirium, and contraindicated in acute narrow angle glaucoma, as they'll and BPH with urinary retention. Next, dopamine blockers like um, prochlorperazine, promethazine, and metaclopramide. These dopamine blockers block CNS dopamine receptors, D1 and D2, in the brain's vomiting center. They're indicated for nausea and vomiting and motion sickness, and importantly, they have side effects of QT prolongation, sedation, and constipation. And importantly also, the QT prolongation and EPS, extrapyramidal symptoms like rigidity, bradykinesia, tremor, akathisia, which is restlessness. Three, P three EPS syndromes can occur. Dystonic reactions, which is dyskinesia. This is reversible EPS hours to days after initiation. Intermittent, spasmodic, sustained, involuntary contractions like trismus of the jaw, protrusions of the tongue, forced jaw opening difficulty speaking, facial grimacing, and torticollis. The management of these dystonic reactions are IV, diphenhydramine, or an anticholinergic agent like benztropine. Next, tardive dyskinesia as well, which is repetitive involuntary movements, mostly involving extremities and face, lip smacking, teeth grinding, rolling of the tongue, and this is seen with long-term use. And next, Parkinsonism, due to decreased dopamine in the nigrostriatal pathways, leads to rigidity and tremor. And important to know NMS, neuroleptic malignant syndrome, as we are inhibiting dopamine. Life-threatening disorder due to D2 inhibition in the basal ganglia, leading to mental status changes, extreme muscle rigidity, tremor, fever, autonomic uh, instability like tachycardia, blood pressure changes, tachypnea, profuse sweating, incontinence importantly, and dyspnea. And you want to do ice to the groin and axillary areas, ventilatory support, and you want to use your um, BAD treatment, B-A-D, for NMS. Bromocryptine, amantadine, and dantrolene. You can also use levodopa or carbidopa. Next, benzodiazepines for nausea and vomiting. Lorazepam, diazepam can be used in refractory patients as it potentiates GABA, 
and serotonin antagonists like ondansetron and grencedron. Me mechanism of action blocks serotonin receptors, the 5-HT3, both peripherally and centrally in the chemoreceptor trigger zone in the medulla, suppressing the vomiting center. Side effects of serotonin antagonists are neurologic with headache and fatigue, nausea and constipation, and also cardiac side effects, prolonging the QT interval and cardiac arrhythmias. So dopamine blockers and serotonin and antagonists can prolong the QT, although QT prolongation is more important with the dopamine blockers. Next, benign paroxysmal positional vertigo, a type of peripheral vertigo most commonly due to displaced otolith particles, the calcium crystals, within the semicircular canals of the inner ear, canalithiasis, <clears throat> most common cause of peripheral vertigo. Clinical manifestations, recurrent episodes of sudden episodic peripheral vertigo lasting 60 seconds or less and provoked with specific head movements like rolling over in bed, lying down, getting up from bed, and looking up. May be associated or accompanied by nausea and vomiting, but it's not associated with hearing loss, tinnitus, or ataxia. The diagnosis of BPPV is the Dix-Hallpike maneuver, which produces fatigable nystagmus, and the management is canalith repositioning with the Epley maneuver or Simant maneuver. Because the episodes are so brief, medical therapy is not usually indicated. So again, Dix-Hallpike for diagnosis and Epley maneuver for management of benign paroxysmal positional vertigo. Next, vestibular neuritis and labyrinthitis. Definitions are vestibular neuritis, inflammation of the vestibular portion of cranial nerve 8, and labyrinthitis, inflammation of the vestibular and cochlear portion of cranial nerve 8. So that's why there's hearing loss and continuous vertigo, as we said, in labyrinthitis. Etiologies, idiopathic, may be associated with viral or post-viral inflammation, importantly. Clinical manifestations, vestibular symptoms for both of them. Continuous peripheral vertigo, dizziness, nausea, vomit, and gait disturbances. Nystagmus is usually horizontal and rotary, away from the affected side. Remember, HFA, horizontal, fatigable, and acute. This is one of the acute causes of vertigo. And also cochlear symptoms, labyrinthitis only, since it is the worst, unilateral hearing loss, and tinnitus. Diagnosis, primary, primarily clinical. Imaging is not usually needed. Neuroimaging and MRI is better over a CT to rule out alternative causes if the symptoms are not fully persistent or consistent with a peripheral lesion. Management, glucocorticoids, first-line management. Symptomatic relief, antihistamines, like meclizine, or anticholinergics or benzos. Both are self-limited. Symptoms usually resolve in weeks without treatment. Next, Meniere's disease. This is also called idiopathic endolymphatic hydrops. Idiopathic distension of the endolymphatic compartment of the inner ear due to excess fluid. Meniere's syndrome is due to an identifiable cause. Meniere disease is idiopathic. Clinical manifestations. Meniere's disease is characterized by four findings. Episodic peripheral vertigo, lasting minutes to hours, plus fluctuating sensory neural hearing loss, low tones initially, tinnitus, and ear fullness due to the fluid. Horizontal nystagmus as well, nausea and vomiting. So the problem is increased fluid in the ear basically. Diagnosis of exclusion, no specific test. Loss of nystagmus with caloric testing, seen in Meniere's. Management initially is diet modifications, especially avoidance of salt, caffeine, nicotine, chocolate, and alcohol because they increase endolymphatic pressure. And then medical management, if no relief with dietary modifications, with antihistamines like meclizine, diminhydrinate, and prochlorperazine or promethazine, also benzos, anticholinergic like scopolamine, diuretics especially, hydrochlorothiazide as it decreases salt, to reduce endolymphatic pressure are all options. And remember, HCTZ increases GLUC, glucose, lipids, uric acid, and calcium. 
refractory management for Meniere's disease, surgical decompression with the tympanostomy tube, labyrinthectomy, or intraoral gentamicin. Next will be acoustic or vestibular neuroma, cranial nerve 8. This is a vestibular schwannoma, a benign tumor involving the Schwann cells, which produces the myelin sheath. It arises from the cerebellopontine angle and can compress structures, the cranial nerves 8, 7, and 5. Clinical manifestations, unilateral sensory neural hearing loss is an acoustic neuroma until proven otherwise. That's unilateral sensory neural hearing loss is an acoustic neuroma. Tinnitus, vertigo, ataxia, headache, facial numbness due to compression of cranial nerve 5, or facial paresis due to compression of cranial nerve 8, or 7 rather, the facial nerve. MRI is the diagnostic, diagnostic choice of test, and audiometry is the laboratory test of choice. Asymmetric sensory neural hearing loss is the most common. So basically, asymmetric sensory neural hearing loss plus neurologic findings of 7, 8, and 5. Surgery or focused radiation therapy depending on age, tumor localization, um, size of the tumor as well. Next, we'll move to nose and sinus disorders. So first, acute rhinosinusitis. This is symptomatic inflammation of the nasal cavity and paranasal sinuses. Acute is 1 to 4 weeks, subacute is 4 to 12 weeks, and chronic is over 12 weeks, importantly. Etiologies, mostly viral, rhinovirus, influenza, and para-influenza. But bacterial is also possible, and it's the same organisms associated with acute otitis media. Strep pneumonia is the most common, H flu, Moraxella cateralis, and group A, streptococcus. Risk factors, most common in the setting of a viral URI, dental infections, smoking, allergies, cystic fibrosis. Clinical manifestations, facial pain or pressure, worse with bending down and leaning forward, headache, malaise, purulent nasal discharge, fever, nasal congestion. Often, patients will develop worsening symptoms after a period of improvement. Diagnosis, primarily clinically. Imaging is not indicated if classic presentation and uncomplicated. CT scan is the imaging test of choice if imaging is needed. And sinus radiographs are not usually needed. If ordered, the waters view is most helpful. Biopsy of the aspirate is the definitive diagnosis but it's usually not needed in most uncomplicated cases. Management of acute rhinosinusitis, symptomatic management, decongestions to promote sinus drainage, analgesics, antihistamines, mucolytics, intranasal corticosteroids, analgesics, and nasal lavage. Antibiotics, importantly, <clears throat> to know the indications in acute rhinosinusitis, only if symptoms persist for over 10 to 14 days, with worsening of symptoms or earlier if severe. So know that 10 to 14 days for the test. And augmentin is the antibiotic of choice. Second line is doxy or respiratory fluoroquinolones. Next, chronic sinusitis. This is inflammation of the nasal cavity and paranasal sinuses for at least 12 consecutive weeks or over three months. Etiologies, bacterial, staph aureus is the most common bacterial cause, also pseudomonas and anaerobes. So in chronic, they're much worse bugs. Also know Wegner's granulomatosis, which is uh, necrosis, and you'll see that saddle nose deformity with a C anchor. Fungal, uh, aspergillus is the most common fungal cause, but also mucor mycosis is the second most common fungal cause. So clinical manifestations of chronic sinusitis, same as acute, Facial pain or pressure or worse with bending down and leaning forward. Headache, malaise, purulent nasal discharge, fever, and nasal congestion. Diagnosis is by biopsy or histologic diagnosis. Allows for the identification of organism to determine the appropriate treatment, especially as it's chronic. So management depends on the etiology. The goal of therapy is to promote sinus drainage, reduce edema, and eliminate infections. This is usually achieved with a combination of nasal irrigation, topical or, or, topical or oral glucocorticoids, and ENT follow-up. Antibiotics, if bacterial, with ENT follow-up. Next, 
mucormycosis or zygomycosis. This is an invasive fungal infection that infiltrates the sinuses, lungs, and CNS. The fungus rapidly dissects the nasal canals and eye into the brain as a very high mortality. So the etiologies are mucor, rhizopus, cunninghamella, and absidia. How I remember this is MRCA, kind of like MRSA, but MRCA, mucor, rhizopus, cunninghamella, and absidia. They're all fungal species, and they're very opportunistic in immunocompromised states. So risk factors most commonly seen with diabetics, especially in DKA, and other immunocompromised states like post-transplant, chemotherapy, HIV. Clinical manifestations are rhino orbital cere uh, cerebral infections, sinusitis, facial pain or pressure worse when bending down and leaning forward, headache, prevalent discharge, progressing to the orbit and brain involvement. So physical exam may develop erythema, swelling, necrosis, or a black eschar on the palate, nasal mucosa or face. So this is very severe, and you'll see on, if you Google it, black eschar, um, very severe, eroding the face. Diagnosis, biopsy or histopathologic examination of the involved tissue. Non-septate broad hyphae with irregular right angle branching. So that's in bold here. Non-septate broad hyphae with irregular right angle 90 degree branching. Management is IV amphotericin B plus surgical debridement is the uh, first line. Next, rhinitis. Three types, allergic, infectious, or vasomotor. The allergic rhinitis is the most common overall type, which, which is an IgE-mediated mast cell histamine release due to allergens, such as pollen, or pollen mold, dust. Infectious uh, rhinovirus is the most common infectious cause, which is the common cold. Also, strep species are less commonly seen. Vasomotor rhinitis which is a non-allergic and non-infectious dilation of the blood vessels due to temperature change, strong smells, humidity, and happens when eating too. Clinical manifestations, sneezing, nasal congestion, itching, clear, watery rhinorrhea, importantly. Eyes, ears, and throat may be involved. Bluish discoloration around the eyes may be seen in allergic. Physical exam for allergic rhinitis, pale or violaceous boggy turbinates, nasal polyps, with a cobblestone mucosa of the conjunctiva. May develop an allergic shiner, which is purple discoloration around the eyes or the nasal bridge from constant rubbing. If it's viral, you'll have erythematous turbinates. Management of allergic rhinitis. Intranasal corticosteroids are the first line if allergic or nasal polyps. Antihistamines, mast cell stabilizers, and short-term decongestants may also be used. Anticholinergic can be used for rhinorrhea. Avoidance and environmental control, as well as exposure radiation. Exposure reduction. Intranasal corticosteroids if allergic. So a note on intranasal glucocorticoids. This is mometasone and flutecazone. The indications are most effective medication for allergic rhinitis, moderate to severe and persistent. Especially with nasal polyps, you should use steroids. Decongestions. Mechanism of action is to improve congestion, little effect on rhinorrhea, sneezing, or itchiness. Intranasal, oxymetazoline, oxymetazoline, phenylephrine, and nefazoline. You could use pseudoephedrine orally as well. Intranasal decongestants used for over three to five days may cause rhinitis medicamentosa, which is rebound congestion. So this can be this occurs with afrin. Next, nasal polyps. This is allergic rhinitis, the most common cause. Oh, allergic rhinitis, the most common cause of nasal polyps, may also be seen in cystic fibrosis. And remember your Samter's triad as well. Clinical manifestations, most are incidental findings, but if large, they can cause obstruction or anosmia, which is a decrease of smell. Diagnosis by direct visualization, pale, boggy mass on the nasal mucosa. They may have findings associated with allergic rhinitis. Management is intranasal glucocorticoids is the initial treatment of choice. Surgical removal may be needed in some cases that are large or if medical therapy is unsuccessful.
For epistaxis, we have anterior epistaxis. The source is the Kesselbach venous plexus, which is the most common site. Etiologies of anterior epistaxis are most commonly associated with nasal trauma. Nose picking is the most common in children. Blowing the nose forcefully as well. Low humidity, hot environment, dry nasal mucosa, rhinitis, alcohol, cocaine use, antiplatelets, foreign bodies. Hypertension does not cause it, but may prolong it. Posterior epistaxis. This is the source of it is the sphenopalatine artery in Woodruff's plexus as the most common site. May cause um, bleeding in both nares and the posterior pharynx. Risk factors hypertension, older patients, and nasal neoplasms. For the management of anterior, you want to do direct pressure as the first line therapy in most cases. Pressure applied at least 5 to 15 minutes with the patient in a seated position, leaning forward to reduce vessel pressure. Untreated septal hematomas can lead to septal destruction if not evacuated. Adjunctive management. Topical vasoconstrictors may be used adjunctively with direct pressure, like oxymetolazone, nasal lidocaine with epinephrine, or 4% cocaine. Cautious use in patients with hypertension. Cauterization, also electrocautery or silver nitrate if the above measures fail and if the bleeding site can be visualized. Also nasal packing, if direct pressure, vasoconstrictors, and cautery are unsuccessful, or in severe bleeding. May consider antibiotics like cephalexin, clindamycin to prevent toxic shock syndrome if packed, which is controversial. Septal hematomas are associated with loss of cartilage if the hematoma is not removed. In post-treatment care, avoid exercise for a few days. Avoid spicy foods as they cause vasodilation. Bacitracin, petroleum gauze, and humidifiers are helpful to moisten the air in the nasal mucosa. The management of posterior are balloon catheters is the most common initial management. <clears throat> so posterior, just balloon catheter right away. Anterior, one through four steps. Pressure is number one. Vasoconstrictor, two. Three, cauterize. Four, packing. But um, balloon catheters are the number one management in posterior. Next, nasal foreign body, most commonly seen in children. Many are asymptomatic, classically present with epistaxis, associated with a muco mucoperlian discharge, foul odor, and nasal obstruction, mouth breathing. Diagnosis, direct visualization, headlight and otoscope, rigid or flexible fiber optic endoscopy. Radiographs not usually needed, but may be helpful if button batteries are suspected and not visualized. Management, removal via positive pressure technique or instrumentation. Positive pressure technique involves having the patient blow his or her nose while occluding the nostril opposite of the foreign body. Oral positive pressure. Parent blows into the mouth while occluding the unaffected nostril used in smaller children. Next, acute pharyngitis or tonsillitis. Etiologies, viral is the most common cause of pharyngitis. Adenovirus, rhinovirus, entero, Epstein-Barr as well. RSV, influenza A and B, and herpes zoster. For bacterial, group A strep, strep pyogenes, is the most common bacterial cause. Clinical manifestations, sore throat, pain or swallowing with phonation, other symptoms based on the etiology. Viral is often, often associated with cough, hoarseness, coryza, conjunctivitis, and diarrhea. Diagnosis, usually clinical for acute pharyngitis, tonsillitis, and symptomatic mainstay of treatment, especially if viral. <clears throat> Strep pharyngitis, strep throat, group A strep, strep pyogenes, rare in children under 3. Highest incidence of rheumatic fever if untreated in children 5 to 15 years of age. So, know your centaur criteria. The more out of these four criteria, the more likely it is to be strep pharyngitis. 1. No cough. 2. Anterior lymphadenopathy. 3. Fever. and 4. White tonsillar exudates. So for clinical manifestations, you have the dysphagia, pain on swallowing and fever, not usually associated with viral infections, um, such as cough, hoarseness, coryza, conjunctivitis, and diarrhea. Physical examination, pharyngeal edema or exudate, tonsillar exudate or petechiae, anterior cervical lymphadenopathy, 
Diagnosis by rapid antigen, antigen detection test is the best initial test, 95% specific, but only 55 to 90% sensitive. Most useful if positive, but if negative, throat culture should be obtained, especially in children 5 to 15 years old. Throat culture to grow strep pyogenes is the definitive diagnosis. Management, penicillin is the first line treatment, penicillin uh, G or VK or amoxicillin. If they have a penicillin allergy, use macrolides, clindamycin, cep uh, cephalosporins. Although cephalosporins do have some cross-reactivity, only 10 to 20%. Complications, rheumatic fever, which is preventable with antibiotics, acute glomerulonephritis, which is not preventable with antibiotics, and note the T-colored urine for that one, and peritonsillar abscess. Also, Ludwig's angina is possible as well. So rheumatic fever is preventable. Acute glomerulonephritis is not preventable. Next, laryngitis. Laryngitis is acute inflammation of the mucosa of the larynx. Viral URI is most common. Adeno, rhinovirus, influenza, RSV, parainfluenza. Bacterial causes include Morxella catarralis and Mycoplasma pneumoniae. Vocal strain as well is a common etiology, such as screaming or singing, and also irritants like acid from GERD, polyps, or laryngeal cancer. <laughs> Clinical manifestations of laryngitis are hoarseness and aphonia, dry or scratchy throat, may have a viral URI, rhinorrhea, cough, sore throat. Diagnosis is usually clinical, and supportive is the mainstay of treatment, hydration, humidification, vocal rest, warm saline gargles, anesthetics, and reassurance. ENT follow-up as needed. So next, PTA, peritonsillar abscess. This is an abscess between the palatine tonsil and the pharyngeal muscles resulting from a complication of tonsillitis or pharyngitis. Most common in adolescents and young adults 15 to 30 years old. It's often polymicrobial, the predominant species is group A streptococcus, strep pyogenes, staph aureus, or respiratory anaerobes. So remember a consequence of strep pyogenes infection. Clinical manifestations, dysphagia, um, severe unilateral pharyngitis, and a high fever. Also the classic muffled or hot potato voice, difficulty handling oral secretions from drooling, and trismus, lockjaw. And remember, this is due to the spasm of the internal um, turgoid muscles in the jaw. Physical examination, swollen or fluctuant tonsil causing uvula deviation to the contralateral side, bulging of the posterior soft palate, anterior cervical lymphadenopathy. For diagnosis, primarily a clinical diagnosis without the need for imaging or labs if it's classic, you can do an ultrasound. CT scan is the best test, however, if imaging is needed to differentiate cellulitis from an abscess itself. Management, drainage, aspiration, or incision to drainage plus antibiotics. So drainage via needle aspiration is preferred or incision and drainage. Antibiotics like augmentin, clindamycin. Also, you could do IV antibiotics like ampicillin sulbactam and clindamycin. And tonsillectomy, usually reserved for patients who fail to respond to drainage. PTA with complications, prior episodes of PTA, or recurrent severe pharyngitis. Prevention, prompt treatment of strep infections. So important for this one, remember that drainage is the um, treatment of choice, plus antibiotics, but definitely drainage. Retropharyngeal abscess, RTA. This is a deep neck space infection located behind the posterior pharyngeal wall. Most common in children 2 to 4 years old. In adults, it is often the result of a penetrating trauma, like a chicken or fish bone, or instrumentation or dental procedures. Etiologies are similar to peritonsillar abscess, often polymicrobial, group A strep, staphylococcus aureus, and respiratory anaerobes. Clinical manifestations, torticollis of the neck, unwilling to move the neck secondary to pain and spasms. Neck stiffness, especially with neck extension, importantly. Fever, drooling, dysphagia, odynophagia, chest pain, muffled hot potato voice, and trismus as well. But most importantly, that torticollis. Physical exam, midline or unilateral posterior pharyngeal wall edema, most common. 
anterior cervical lymphadenopathy, a lateral neck mass or swelling. Diagnosis, lateral neck radiograph. Increased pre-vertebral space over 50% of the width of adjacent vertebral body may be performed if low suspicion. CT scan of the neck with contrast is preferred in high suspicion. In smaller children with respiratory distress, evaluation is often done in the operating room. Management, surgical incision and drainage with antibiotics for large and mature abscesses in the OR. Abscesses under 2.5 cm squared may be observed for one to two days with antibiotic therapy. Antibiotics, um, ampicillin sulbactam, unison, or clindamycin, similar to a PTA. Complications, airway obstruction, mediastinitis due to spread of the infection, sepsis, and atlantoaxial diso uh, dislocation. Next, oral lichen planus. Idiopathic cell-mediated immune response affecting the skin and mucous membranes. Most common in the middle age, age range. Increased incidence with hepatitis C infection. Clinical manifestations, reticular for oral lichen planus. The lacy reticular leukoplakia of the oral mucosa is most common. This is the Wickham striae. Usually painless, most common type. Erythematous or red patches may accompany the reticular lesions and may be painful. Erosions or ulcers and they're usually painful. But most importantly that Wickham striae, the lacy reticular pattern um, of the oral mucosa. So remember for uh, lichen planus, purple, papules, plaques, pruritic, planar, and polygonal. Diagnosis, mainly clinical. Biopsy often performed in the erythematous and erosive types to rule out malignancy. Management, local glucocorticoids is the initial management of choice, like betamethasone. Second line, topical, tacrolimus, pimecrolimus, or cyclosporin, intralesional corticosteroid injections. Systemic glucocorticoids if no response to therapy. So for lichen planus, orally, glucocorticoids. Next, Ludwig's angina. This is a rapidly spreading cellulitis of the floor of the mouth. Bilateral infection of the submandibular space. Risk factors commonly um, due to spread of oral flora secondary to dental infections, secondary or third mandibular molars, increased incidence of diabetes in diabetes and HIV, polymicrobial. So it spreads underneath the neck area to the floor of the mouth. Also in strep pharyngitis, it can be a, it can be a side effect. Clinical manifestations, fever, chills, malaise, stiff neck, dysphagia, drooling, muffled voice, respiratory difficulty and severe, such as strider. Physical examination, you have tenderness and symmetric swelling or a woody induration. Erythema of the upper neck and chin may have palpable crepitus, pus on the floor of the mouth. Swelling of the tongue can lead to airway obstruction, no lymphadenopathy or abscess information. So it's a cellulitis, not an abscess. Management if immunocompetent. Um, ampicillin sulbactam or ceftriaxone plus metronidazole or clinda plus levo. Add vancomycin if MRSA is suspected. Management if immunocompromised. IV antibiotics, cefepime plus metronidazole or imipenem or meropenem or piperacillin tazobactam. Add vanc if MRSA is suspected. Next, oropharyngeal candidiasis, thrush. Candida albicans is part of the normal flora but can become pathologic due to local or systemic immunocompromised states. Risk factors, immunocompromised states, HIV, chemotherapy, diabetics, use of inhaled corticosteroids without a spacer, importantly, antibiotic use, xerostomia, or denture use. So always wash the mouth out after um, patients with asthma use an inhaled corticosteroid. Clinical manifestations, asymptomatic. Loss of taste or cotton feel in the mouth, loss of throat or mouth pain with eating or swallowing. Physical examination, white curd-like plaques on the buccal mucosa, tongue, palate, or the, oral or the oral pharynx that are easily scraped off may leave behind erythema or a friable mucosa if scraped. So they are easily scraped off in candidiasis.
The denture form may be associated with erythema only. Diagnosis, clinical. Potassium hydroxide, the KOH stain, will find budding yeast and pseudohyphae. Smear performed on the scrapings. You can do a fungal culture, but that's rarely done. Mostly the KOH uh, smear. Management, topical therapy is the, um, topical therapy is the first line therapy. Nystatin liquid swish and swallow. You can also use clotrimazole or myconazole mucoadhesive buccal tablets. Oral fluconazole, usually reserved for refractory cases in patients with both oropharyngeal and esophageal candidiasis. Next, aptus ulcers, also known as canker sore or ulcerative stomatitis. Unknown cause, but may be associated with H, uh, human herpes virus 6. Recurrent disease seen in patients with inflammatory bowel disease, HIV, celiac disease, SLE, on methotrexate, as well as neutropenia. <laughs> Clinical manifestations, small, painful, shallow, round, or oval, shallow ulcers, yellow, white, or gray central exudates with erythematous halo. Most common on the buccal or labial mucosa, non-keratinized mucosa. Management, topical oral glucocorticoids are the first line for aptus ulcers. Clobetazole gel or ointment, dexamethasone elixir, swish and spit, as well as triamcinolone in orobase. Topical analgesics, 2% viscous lidocaine, diphenhydramine liquid, aluminum hydroxide plus magnesium hydroxide plus semethicone. So topical glucocorticoids or 2% viscous lidocaine. Oral leukoplakia. Oral potentially malignant disorder characterized by hyperkeratosis due to chronic irritation. Up to 6% are dysplastic or squamous cell carcinoma. Risk factors, chronic irritation due to tobacco, cigarette smoking, alcohol, dentures, or HPV infections for oral leukoplakia. Clinical manifestations, most are asymptomatic, but otherwise they'll have a painless white patchy lesions that cannot be scraped off. In comparison to candida, which can be scraped off and is painful. Diagnosis, biopsy to rule out squamous cell carcinoma, as this is potentially malignant. In management, cessation of irritants like alcohol and smoking. You can also do cryotherapy, laser ablation, and surgical excision are options if increased risk for malignancy or they are malignant. Erythroplakia. This is an uncommon oral lesion with a high risk for malignant transformation. 90% of erythroplakia is either dysplastic or shows evidence of squamous cell carcinoma. Risk factors are chronic irritation due to tobacco, cigarette smoking, and age over 65. Clinical manifestations, most are asymptomatic, painless erythematous soft velvety patch in the oral cavity, most common on the mouth floor, soft palate, and ventral aspect of the tongue. Diagnosis is a biopsy to rule out squamous cell carcinoma, and management complete excision depending on the biopsy results. So in comparing uh, leukoplakia to erythroplakia, the white oral leukoplakia, 6% end up becoming squamous cell carcinoma, and red erythroplakia, 90% end up being squamous cell carcinoma. And remember, both of these are painless and cannot be scraped off, unlike um, candidiasis, which is painful and can be scraped off. Next, sialolithiasis, salivary gland stones. Stones within the salivary gland or duct, not, infl not inflammation. Most common in Wharton's duct, directly under the tongue. This is the submandibular gland duct, as well as Stenson's duct, which is the side of the cheek, which is the parotid gland duct. So this is Wharton's duct, not, don't get it confused with Woodruff's plexus and posterior um, epistaxis. Risk factors, decreased salivation, dehydration, anticholinergic agents, remember decreasing that salivation, and diuretics. Clinical manifestations, sudden onset of salivary gland pain and swelling with eating or anticipation of eating. So, so the sudden, rev sudden revving up of the gland to secrete saliva causes the pain. The stone may be palpated in the salivary gland, and if the gland is compromised and no saliva flows, the stone can be obstructive, leads to infection. The diagnosis is usually clinical, 
and management is conservative. First line treatment are sialagogues to increase salivary flow like tart hard candies, lemon drops, xylitol containing gum or candy, increased fluid intake, gland massage, or moist heat to the affected area. Definitely avoid anticholinergic drugs if possible as anticholinergics decrease salivation. Minimally invasive therapy includes sialoendoscopy, uh, laser lithotripsy, extracorporeal lithotripsy, also surgery, sialoadenectomy, reserved for um, recurrent stones or failure of less invasive techniques. So stop anticholinergics, hydrate, and sialagogues like candies. Next, acute bacterial sialadenitis, separative sialadenitis. Bacterial infection of the parotid or submandibular salivary glands. So remember, parotid is Stenson's duct, and submandibular is Wharton's duct. Etiologies, Staph aureus is the most common cause, strep pneumoniae, strep viridans, H. flu, bacterioides. Risk factors, salivary gland obstruction from a stone, dehydration, or chronic illness. Clinical manifestations of acute bacterial. Sudden onset, very firm and tender gland, swelling with purulent discharge, may be able to express pus if the duct is massaged. Dysphagia, trismus, reduced opening of the jaw due to spasms of the muscles of mastication. Remember, temporalis, um, the masseter, as well as the internal and external turgoids. Fever and chills if severe. Diagnosis, CT scan to assess for associated abscess or extent of tissue involvement. Management, anti-staphylococcal antibiotics, plus sialagogues to increase salivary flow, tart or hard candies. Can also use dicloxacillin or nafcillin. Metronidazole can be added for anaerobic coverage, clindamycin. Next, acute herpetic gingivo gingivostomatitis. Inflammation of the gums and the oral mucosa primarily a manifestation of HSV-1 in children. Most commonly occurs between six months and five years. Clinical manifestations, a prodrome of sudden onset of fever, anorexia, malaise, and refusal to eat or drink, followed by oral lesions. The gingivostomatitis will have ulcerative lesions of the gingiva, gum swelling with friability and bleeding, and vesicles on the mucous membranes of the mouth, often with perioral vesicular lesions clustered on an erythematous base, dew drops on a rose petal, classically. After rupture, the vesicles become ulcerated, yellow, and are surrounded by an erythematous halo. They may coalesce to form painful ulcers. You may also have regional lymphadenopathy. The diagnosis is clinical, and management is supportive care as the mainstay of treatment. Hydration, oral hygiene, barrier creams, like petroleum jelly, Lesions usually heal within one week. You can do oral acyclovir if within 72 to 96 hours of disease onset if they are unable to drink and have significant pain. IV acyclovir if immunocompromised. Next, acute herpetic pharyngotonsillitis. Primarily an infection, um, a manifestation of herpes simplex virus 1 in adults, not in children, like acute herpetic gingivosomatitis. Clinical manifestations, fever, malaise, headache, sore throat, physical exam, vesicles that rupture, leaving an ulcerative lesion of grayish exudates in the posterior pharynx. Management, oral hygiene, lesions usually resolve in one to two weeks. Oral hairy leukoplakia, mucocutaneous manifestation of Epstein-Barr virus, um, human herpes virus 4. Risk factors almost exclusively seen in HIV-infected patients. Other immunocompromised states like post-transplant, chronic steroids, or chemo. Clinical manifestations, painless, white, smooth, or corrugated, hairy plaques along the lateral tongue borders or buccal mucosa that cannot be scraped off. Management, no specific treatment, may uh, spontaneously resolve, and is not considered a pre-malignant lesion antiretroviral treatments in patients with HIV. So this is different. This oral hairy leukoplakia is from EBV, whereas the oral leukoplakia is different, and that's uh, having, having a risk of squamous cell carcinoma. And lastly, 
to go over ototoxic medications. Loop diuretics are ototoxic, such as furosemide, bumetanide, ethacrinic acid, which is the most ototoxic. Antibiotics, vancomycin, aminoglycosides, like gentomycin, uh, macrolides, erythromycin, and tetracyclines. And remember, your aminoglycosides are STANG, S-T-A-N-G, streptomycin, tobramycin, amicacin, neomycin, and gentamicin. Also, anti-inflammatories are ototoxic, like aspirin and NSAIDs, and anti-neoplastic agents, like cisplatin, carboplatin, and cytarabine. Also, anti-malarials are ototoxic, like chloroquine, hydroxychloroquine, and quinine. And that will conclude our ENT section of Pants Prep Pearls.